This episode is a return of Mark Fitzpatrick. Um, we discuss lots of creative things about using non de plumes, um, conspiracy theories, etc. Um, and this gets more and more interesting as it goes along. <laughs> Welcome back, Mark Fitzpatrick. And one of my blogs I put out, I put Mark Fitzgerald, because obviously I have family that are called Fitzgerald. <laughs> oh, it's, it's all right. So, a lot of people so that's how much we love you, Mark. Mm. You're one of the it's, family. It's okay. <laughs> um, so, so as you've been on before, we have a backup question. How was Christmas? It was it was lovely and full of seasonal cheer. Good. Um, and Excellent. and I ate, I ate capon and poulard. How dare you? That sounds I know. amazing. I know. It was it was great. I mean, if you know, Christmas in the south of France is pretty good because it's really all about the food. Yes. You know, it's not the presents are kind of an afterthought, but the food was the food was incredible. Um, and they also do, you know, their big, their big feed is on the, the eve, so they do Christmas Eve is a big dinner and New Year's Eve is a big dinner. But because we were with kind of extended family, there was also a backup big dinner on Christmas Day and on New Year's Day. So we sort of had four massive um, feasts and uh, we had you know, my wife's family and my parents were around. Right. And um, it was it was. It was great. It was great. Um, and it's the first time I've ever really uh, spent Christmas uh, in the countryside. And well, we did last year as well, but um, now that we've moved here permanently. Um, and that was lovely. Like it was, you know, walking out on a frosty morning and um, listening to the birds sing and the rising of the sun, the running of the deer, that kind of thing, you know. Right. That's good. That's good. That sounds wonderful. Um, so, in the previous episodes, which of course maps out certain aspects of what you do, um, maybe you can just outline it for the people that, you know, th those people who haven't listened to the previous ones. How dare they? I um, um, no. Well, this is, this is, um, bri briefly you know, outline what you do and then we'll go down another rabbit hole. Yeah, this is, this is Mark Fitzpatrick three, this time it's personal. Um, but, <laughs> No, actually, we, I mean, the thing is, we, we, we led off with a big, long spiel about what it's like to be Irish, because yeah. Irish, Irish people love talking about that. Um, and then we talked a lot about, um, about art and creativity and my work. And um, I'm, a, I'm a teacher of literature, and I'm also, and have been sort of forever, um, working away at writing, um, particularly, particularly fiction. But in the last few years, uh, I've sort of discovered more and more um, that poetry is perhaps the thing that I am most interested in, in a way. And um, so we've talked about that. And, um, and then I think, um, I think this time we're going to go, go for the more sort of weird and obscure stuff. Yes. And that sounds great to me. As we're coming into the, um, well, we're sort of roughly around the epiphany, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. I, I get confused because I think it's the sixth, but then I saw somewhere recently that they were like, no, no, the seventh is a bit new, but um, I don't know. Do you know which day it is? Um, good like, question. Because there was, anyway, there's, you know, there's something about Orthodox Christmas and Julian calendar and mm. um, all that stuff, but, and then 12 days of Christmas, but then the next one is Epiphany or is Epiphany the 12th? Well, I... Um, it's not actually marked on anything that I've got, so I can't give you a straight answer. Mm, I would guess it was... Uh, this is not going to answer it, is it? Um, my guess is it's, it's today, but I, I've got a sneaking think, suspicion it was yesterday. Mm, I think you might be right, though, because I think that if you count 12 days, is the 6th is the 12th day, but then 12th night is the, is the eve of Epiphany. Right. 
That's, because that's that's what they call in France. They call that la nuit des rois, which which sounds like because of the French thing of celebrating the night before, it's the eve of the day of Epiphany, which then yeah. would be the seventh. Yes, and I think it might be that. Yes, um, I think that that actually makes sense. And again, like a lot of these things, it's like well, it's not exactly a movable feast, obviously, but it's a, a feast that probably wasn't at that point. You never know, do you? Because it's all been sort of locked into calendars that weren't the calendars, as you said. Yeah, of course. And, you know, and, um, you know like if Jesus existed, he was probably born in the spring anyway, or, you know, um, him, his birth being aligned with the winter solstice is uh, pretty sort of, ar- not arbitrary, but it's um, well probably unrelated to any evidence. Yes. Um, I mean, it was certainly not arbitrary. It was like, well, we, we definitely need, to take some of that, steal some of the thunder of Mithraism, yes. or whatever it was, and yes. all the all the other solar cults. Yes. And so we're going to have our solar deity also born at midwinter. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Um, but um, I actually celebrated Epiphany yesterday um, with the launch of a new venture as well. Um, I've been for the last uh, for the last twelve days then. Um, on my, my blog, my website, I've been finally publishing work by other collaborators, new ones. And we did a 12 days of Christmas, like D-A-Z-E. And so right. each day, well, it wasn't actually each day, but it was like corresponding to each one of the 12, you know, um, two turtle doves, three French hens and all that. Yeah. But there was a, a short story or, or a piece essay was published on, on the blog every day. Um, or at least one for every day. And then yesterday, um, I launched a YouTube channel. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, wow. And it's all part of the same sort of project, but the YouTube channel is kind of fun. Um, and it's um, it's under one of my nom de plume, which is Malicus Ivernus. Um, and if you can find it on YouTube by searching Malicus Ivernus. And I started a series called The Dream Pipes of Malicus Avernus, which involves me sitting and speaking to the camera while smoking a pipe. Ah. I thought that was, you know, it's kind of fun. Um, when, I first, when I first met you, that's all I knew you as to start with. That's right. That was my secret identity at the time. It was. And it was, it was part of a whole, um, I think we mentioned this last time as well, a whole experiment to do with uh, pseudonyms and persona. And, and it was a very fruitful one, but now i find myself in the happy position of being able to take all those um secret identities and reveal them all as me and sort of come out from behind the from behind the persona the mask which is what persona literally means yes it Um, does so you know it's it's cool it's cool to kind of you know be able to put my name on things um it's just it's due to a change in employment like i was in a job where just in case I didn't want to sort of publish stuff under my own name. Mm. And so um, at the end of the month, I'm going to also publish a book. I've got um, my first novel is going to come out. Wow. So I've been been really busy. And, um, you know, it was sort of being on your your podcast uh, back in, was it it November? It was November, yeah. Mm. Um, That was... That was sort of, you know, one of the things that got the ball rolling on oh. myself. Oh. You know, I I need to I need to take this stuff seriously and get yeah. some stuff out there, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah. so I just basically looked around myself and said, "How do you publish a book if every time you have submitted a book for publication or to an agent, they've all they've always said, oh, this is really good, really good, really good. Can't sell it. Sorry." Um, which is what I've always got. Like I've got lots of really, really nice rejection letters. Um, and they always said, it's really well written and it's really interesting and it's really, you know, well crafted and everything. But it's just, it's just not relatable and it's not commercial and it's not exciting enough and nothing really happens and or that kind of thing. Um, and, and I said, yeah, no, it's supposed to be like that. Um, one of them said, it's too, it's too dreamy and meandering and lyrical. And I was like, yeah, exactly. Um, but that was my, that was my um, 
sort of maiden voyage of a novel which may never see the light of day and the one that is going to come out is actually a much more fun thing which is um it's a kind of a pastiche of late 19th century gothic um set in paris it's about um wizards and various malcontents in paris um trying to do evil stuff to each other and it's um it's it's sort of presented as a scholarly edition of an old book so you've got the editor's introduction and his notes in which he desperately tried to communicate with um his publisher who stopped answering his emails so there's a kind of a there's a sort of a, like a parenthetical story going on in the footnotes um it's, it's fun it's fun and i think it's going to be um enjoyable um to just you know put it out there and see what happens and and I've got some amazing collaborators because I decided, well, it's it's short and it would make a really good illustrated book. So I got some I got some artists I know to work on it, and I've got someone I've had some friends doing some really great editing work on it, and I've got someone doing the layout and graphic design on it, and and in the end, it's going to represent an investment on my part, um, but not as much as you'd think, and. Um, and it's actually going to be a really cool thing to have done. And um, at the end of the day, if I'm not sure it will make any money, but that's not the point. At least it will get into the hands of some people who never would have read it otherwise. Right. There's a few interesting comparisons that I can draw with recording albums and trying to get record mm. deals. Yeah. Um, because, you know, obviously I started quite early on trying to get record deals, which I never got. I nearly got one, um, but it was a, a bizarre story, which I, I won't go into that. But um, <laughs> what I realised was that to really get a record deal, you'd have to find out the record company, who they've got on their books, and then do something that's very similar to what is already there with a slight little twist to it. Yeah which is exactly what exactly. you're saying about producing, writing a book and giving it to a, a particular publisher. If they could look at it and go, this is in our ballpark, you know, mm -hmm. that's okay. But of course, if you're trying to create something, it's, it's not, it's not going to, you're not going to do that, are you? Imagine sort of, writing, you know, dear Mr. Joyce, I thought your, your book was well-crafted but rather dreamy. I mean, this is that's interesting that you say that. It's interesting that you choose Joyce as an example because no publisher would touch Ulysses um, because they all thought that it was bizarre and obscene. Well, it was, and also <laughs> not, and not it. Well, it was, and also nothing happens, no. but for a thousand pages, and you know he um, he had it. It was published like it was privately published by Sylvia Beach at Shakespeare and Company, you know, with her own money. Um, I think they did a. They did a subscription or something, you know, they got people to, to it was like crowdfunding, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the first edition was very few copies. And of course, those are worth, you know, loads of money now. But then at the time, he made and they, the, those kind of modernist artists, they made a virtue out of that scarcity. And they made a virtue out of the scandal because, you know, there was all these stories about, um, people having volumes of it confiscated going through customs into the US and they made a virtue of the fact that it was like a nice edition and there was only whatever it was 600 copies um, because then I mean they were consciously creating collector's items from the very beginning Yes, and they knew the people who subscribed to the, to the edition which means basically I think that they, they basically paid for them in advance and the people who subscribed knew that they were making an investment because they knew Joyce was a genius or somebody who they trusted had told them that Joyce was a genius. Yes. And, you know, the, I, I think people forget how similar things were back then. Yes. Because actually publishers wanted to, all they wanted to do was publish the next bestseller always, yeah. you know, there weren't, there weren't these kind of, altruistic publishers going around looking for literary value. Um, piracy was a huge issue. You know, 
it was really hard to control uh, copyright between, say, Britain and America. So in America, pirate editions flourished. And, um, and you know, they were kind of, the authors were usually totally broke and sponging off their rich friends and patrons and who occasionally would say, right, you know, um, I'm going to buy the manuscript of your next book. So here's 500 quid to pay your rent for a couple of months um, or for a year. And um, now you get down to it and write the book. And it was like he was giving him an advance, but it was private patronage. Yeah. Which, of course, is the way that the arts has always been funded in the period of time that it was funded like that, if that makes sense, because obviously prior to people who could be a, you know, people who could be patrons. Um, yeah. It yeah. would have been done in a different way. The whole, but the whole, soon the whole you, idea you, of, the whole idea of royalties and stuff like that is really relatively new, like copyright and royalties and author's rights. It was in the 1880s, I think. Um, Walter Besant, the author society in, in Britain, campaigned for, for the right to have copyright because otherwise publishers would just buy a book and then they would make all the money and there was no royalties you know authors didn't really make much money unless they had sort of invested in the printing themselves and they were kind of they were an investor but you know most things were published by people who could just afford to write because they didn't need money that's interesting. So did you say Walter Besant? That's right, yeah. That's not, if I said it a different way, that's not um, the husband of Annie Besant, is it? I believe he is either husband or brother, yeah. Ah, so the, yeah. This, is a, this is an interesting thing, isn't it? Mm. You suddenly end up with two people who, in their own little way, are transforming the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, they were they were campaigning for fair treatment, you know, for fair treatment of women and authors and other oppressed minorities. And India. And India, indeed. indeed. Uh, yes. Um, and and Annie Besant or Besant was um, she was also a pretty big spiritualist and theosophist, yes. wasn't she? Theosophist. Yeah. Because uh, it's see, actually, that, see that segue. Yes. So, th yeah, that's a fantastic thing, because obviously she was. Um, did they, I think she was part of uh, the, the, the people who set up the, um, what was it called? The National Indian, oh, what's it called? It was basically the thing that got in, uh, Indian independence underway over mm -hmm. time. Um, I think so. And she was, but she was also um, a feminist campaigner. Yes. And she was, yes, she, she was. was very involved in charities and, yes. but not just that kind of like patronage style charity where it's the duty of the rich to help the less fortunate. But also she was, she campaigned for, for laws and rights. Mm. And uh, she, she was a suffragist as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, quite, um, like, quite likely. Um, I mean, she was, and, and I'm pretty sure, pretty sure she was a socialist. Um, you know, all the good stuff. Yes. And, and, and is it a coincidence that she was one of the founding members of the Golden Dawn? Yes. No coincidences at all, of course. Because there's always been a crossover yeah. uh, between mysticism and magic and um, people who want to change the world, right? For, yes. for good or for ill. Yes. So, you know, I think it, it continues today. You see people who are involved in um, sort of magical orders or magical activities um, there's a strong presence of extreme right and extreme left mm. in those circles mm. um, because they're attracted to, to the idea of a kind of mythic struggle, but it just depends on where they place themselves in the mythic struggle. You know, um, I think that um, it's one of the, it's a recurring theme, uh, you know, the sort of, People talk about like the infiltration of, let's say, uh, Norse paganism by white supremacists, neo-Nazis, or they talk about, um, you, you know, um, pagan circles having a problem with authoritarian um, sort of eco-fascist types. But the thing is, it's always been the case. 
it's always been like that, you know? Um, there have always been people who are interested in magic for power, and there have always been people who are interested in magic to make the world a more enchanted place. And then, you know, all the people in the middle who are just doing it to make a living. You know, your, sort of, your local cunning man is not particularly invested in politics either way, probably. No, probably not. Probably not. So that's it. that was an interesting segue into uh, how these things are, you know, because I always think this type of thinking is always just under the surface. Um, and um, for a lot of people, they're drifting along quite merrily, thinking that, you know, this physical thing is the thing and that's it, you know, until they get a moment of crisis and then suddenly mm. they have to sort of... Um, think about the, the thing that they haven't thought about, like what happens when what, what, is, what, what is it they say, like, that there's, there are no atheists in the trenches? Yeah, there's no atheist in the foxhole. You know, in, in other words, where you're being shot at and you, you can't stick your head above the parapet. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Mark, I think you've frozen on that. So, could you... Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. I'm back. Okay. Yeah, right. You froze too. Um, one of us must have said something. Yes. That that you know that gave pause to the entire airwaves. Exactly. Yes. So there was a kind of a, we we basically like reality just took a dramatic pause. Yes, it, I think it's the it's the zoom it's the zoom uh, gremlins who who have to cycle very hard to keep zoom working. <laughs> they suddenly sort of stop and think, "What did they say?" And for a moment, you get a bit. Um, yeah, something like that. So, before we hit record, we had a little bit of a, a dip into into an interesting area because we were talking about. I, I just I'd done a previous podcast about asking, just a solo podcast about asking the obvious question, and I think this is actually quite an important uh, creative thing to do because I think really good artists, you know. Um, see things in a different way because they're, they're questioning mm. um, reality or or the, the the preconceived notions that you've been fed yeah. about things. For most people, I don't think there's a I don't think there's a lot of um, analysing of what you've been told. Um, no, I mean it's 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 not just being told; it's being conditioned, isn't it? Like yes. Culturally conditioned, socially yes. conditioned, like to believe a certain set of things, yes. a certain set of rules, which kind of keep us quiet and keep us plugging away at mm. doing stuff that we don't particularly like for most of the day. No, that's right. Um, so, what would you say? Because obviously, but coming from Coming from the Emerald Isle, um, you've probably got a very keen eye and ear to things that are being said that you could look at and you go, yeah, okay. I can see this is just a load of oh, nonsense. It's, it's interesting you say that because they, they say that, um, I read a fascinating article that was actually written by a French um, sort of politologue, like a, a political uh, scientist, and he was analysing the fact that Ireland is one of the few countries in Europe that has almost no um, establishment of far-right parties or there's no grip, because Irish people are very fundamentally anti-authoritarian um, because we've been a colonised country for, you know, we were a colonised country for nearly 800 years before we gained independence. And... Um, and we have a healthy disregard for authority and a healthy solidarity between the oppressed. Um, you know, it's like that thing of like, in Ireland, if you see someone stealing food, no, you didn't, um, that kind of thing. Or if a politician tells you something, you assume it's a lie. You just go, ah, sure, they're all a load of you know, chancers. Chancers. Yes. You know, um, 
But Irish people, Irish people are very skeptical of authority, and they also undermine it with satire, um, yes, very much. So yeah, I think it's true that Irish people are naturally um, not too gullible when it comes to the things that were being fed from on high. There's also the other thing, of course, you, you're saying about the you know 800 years of colonization, but but prior to that, of course. You didn't have a unified country. It was all little, little kingdom areas, wasn't it? Which yeah, well, I mean, very, very few pe people did, unless you go back to the Roman Empire. I mean, there were very few unified nations. There was lots of small kingdoms everywhere, and Ireland was the same, you know. But it, but was, it lasted longer, didn't it? You know, it lasted a really long time, and it was particularly pronounced. Like um, somebody said at one point that um, there were over a hundred little kingdoms in Ireland. And Ireland is small, mm. but, you know, there was sort of kingdoms and sub-kingdoms and sub-kingdoms. And it wasn't exactly feudalism, but it was a bit like that. Um, clientelism, I think, more like. And, um, you know, and, and the balance of power could shift. And sometimes there was a high king of all Ireland, but rarely. And it was usually the king of one of the major provinces who could pretend to high kingship but usually only by allying with one of the other provinces yes. against the other two. Uh, well, there's also a fifth province, which was like the royal province in the middle. Um, anyway, yeah, it, I mean, Irish politics were also very interesting like that. And we didn't have um, primogeniture and hereditary. Heredity. Um, the kingships were not automatically passed from father to son. Um there was a system called tonistry, whereby all of the all of the people who share the same grandparent grandfather as the current king are eligible for kingship, mm. and he names his tonishta, which is still the name of the the, the second in command to the prime minister. This, the the first minister is called the tonishta, um, and his tonishta was his his appointed heir and his second in command. But the Tonishta didn't automatically inherit. Um, the Tonishta had to kind of prove himself against any challengers um, or herself, because you know the, there weren't a lot of queens, but there was a, a significant minority of queens that ruled in Ireland as well. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I, I so know that was, I know that from the, the thing about the the Viking situation in you know in in Europe and in. Uh, well, certainly in, in, in England, mm. you kill the king and you kill the, the close family, you're in charge. But of course, exactly. you can't do that if you've got loads of kings, can you? It's very difficult. No, no, exactly true. And But also, I mean, the other thing is in Ireland, there was a lot of, um, if you look at the, the, the annals, the, the annals of four masters, the histories, um, a lot of sort of reigns of kings ended with kings being overthrown and slaughtered or exiled by their by the people because they were like well I'm not having any more of this yeah and, and you know it was a so so as a king it was in your interest to have your sort of party be strong and make alliances and they made alliances through hospitality and gift giving um and honor and uh praise you know, there was a really, really elaborate social fabric. Um, and so being a king was playing a game. It wasn't like, I'm the king, screw you. It was, I'm the king, what can I do for you? You know, what favor would you like from me so that you owe me one? Um, you know, which, I mean, it sounds, sounds a bit like modern politics, to be honest. In Ireland, at least. Yes. So this... Um we mentioned about you know sort of pre pre chat about sort of conspiracy because I think this is quite an interesting thing to to kick into gear before we get into some other meaty subjects. Yeah. yeah, no, we're we're in danger of meeting a rabbit hole at any moment. So let's choose our rabbit hole. Mm, let's do this one first because I think this yeah. is something which is misunderstood and needs a little bit of elaboration. I think. Yeah, go, go on. How, how do you, how do you? Well, I'm quite intrigued by this because to be 
it's always a good sort of get out of jail card for people, you know, who are in, in charge to be able to go, cons- you know, put up the conspiracy theory banner and say, that's mm. nonsense. But of course, it's a very easy way to, and this is something I think is really important for me anyway. Um, it's a very easy way of deflecting things that are true by pointing at some people that are obviously very unusual mm. and very out there and then making what that person says to be, you know, to encompass all of that thing and then go conspiracy theory without looking yeah. at, you know, the smoke, if you like. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. And I think it's the, it's a subtle propaganda tool of government is you know always associate any dissenting movement with its most extreme fringes yeah. as the as the spokespeople let them have a voice and then discredit everyone with that i mean the exact same thing goes on with them um, the whole debate about identity politics cancelling political correctness you know they always pick the most ridiculous example yes and it makes the news and everyone loves it because it sounds so stupid yes but then the horrible effect is that that literally discredits people who just want equality, diversity. Uh, you know, political correctness is just another word for common decency. Um, but to go back to your thing about conspiracy theory, um, I think, and I'm not, I'd have to look up the reference to this, but it's from the 1960s, like the term itself from the 1960s was an FBI sort of construction where they decided, look at all these extremists who believe in whatever. And I think they were particularly aiming at um, hippies and far left groups at the time. Um, they were looking at them and saying, well, they believe in some wacky stuff. Let's, let's tar them with that brush. Yeah. Um, and we're going to call them conspiracy theorists, which makes them sound like cranks and hysterics um, because, you know, it's only a theory. They're making up theories about ridiculous conspiracies. Um, in fact, I mean, without you know wanting to go all the way into this, um, the whole Illuminati thing was invented as a satire of this. And now, you know, 50, 60 years later, there's a ton of people out there who believe it. But the worst thing is, what better cover for a cabal? of yes. rich and powerful people who control yes. the world than a myth of a yes. cabal of rich yes. and powerful people who control the world, right? Yes. It's just, it's perfect. You know, it's literally the devil convincing us he doesn't exist. Exactly. Exactly. And this, I, I find this quite interesting because it's in a lot of things, you know, even historically, because one of the things I've always puzzled about, um, Second World War is a good example of this. America's mm. involvement in the Second World War. Yeah. The American people did not want to get involved. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But Roosevelt knew that that's what they would have to do. And he would somehow have to get the American people on board. Um, There was obviously a lot of possibilities to make money. I'm not saying that's why he did it, but you Mm. could see that there was no, if, if you had a fascist Europe, you're between a rock and a hard place. You know, yeah. if you've got fascists and communists, you need to get some sort of balance in there. So the, the thing that fascinated me about this was the fact that the Americans, because of the British, obviously, knew what the Germans were up to with regard to mm. whether they were going to do anything, you know, sink U-boat, U-boat sink American shipping and all that sort of stuff. But the thing that really fascinated me was something that I heard to do with Pearl Harbor. Mm. Now, the Americans knew that, and the British knew that the Japanese were going to attack somewhere. They just didn't know where. Mm. I think Pearl Harbor was assumed to be too far away. But they knew that they had, there were Japanese spies in Pearl Harbor. They knew that. Um, and the fascinating thing of all of this is when the Japanese actually attacked, because they knew there was an attack coming, but they just literally knew the boats were in at sea, Mm. but they just didn't know where it was going to go. 
the um, the carriers weren't in Pearl Harbor. Hmm. They were the things that you had to have mm -hmm. to win a win a war in the in the Pacific, and they weren't there, hmm. which is one weird thing. And there was a story which I've not been able to track back, which I I heard to do with one. You know, it was one of these sort of historical programs. It might have been the World War, but probably wasn't. When about the Ameri the uh, Japanese attack, that they had a form of radar, and they saw these these planes coming in, and they they phoned across to say, "Look, there's these craft. We don't know where they are," and somebody said, "Ignore them." Hmm. Now, whether that's true or not, whether I misheard that, but it was like it was completely discounted as being not important. Now, mm. if you knew there was an attack coming. Right. Somebody knew. Um, and the Americans had caused such a lot of problems with the Japanese because of sanctions. It was quite likely the Japanese, if they had the chance, were going to attack the Americans anyway. Right? Of course, yeah. Um, but of course, you look at that, and, it, and then after that, the Germans just happened to declare war on the, the Americans. Mm. So they obviously did actually declare war on the Americans, but the point was, how did they get to that point where they declared war on the Americans? Because it's to me, it's always about deflection. It's mm. not about the obvious thing that somebody did that was kept secret. It's mm. like seeing something coming and thinking, okay, they're making a, a calculation to make that thing go in your favor, which yeah. I think actually it's kind of relevant, right? I think it's case. very, very relevant because I think it's actually very common. Mm. You know, the, the, I think so. I think so. The, the British, and you know, the British Empire was based on excuses to attack somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think that, like, one of the, um, one of the amazing results of propaganda um, that we have seen, especially in the say, second half of the twentieth century, but obviously it's nothing new. Um, you know. The sort of the propaganda playbook, um, which I you know I think that quotes from um, the art of war and stuff yes. too, that that, yeah. that, uh, that reflect this, where it's like all you need is um, is a scapegoat and a motive kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you have a bogeyman, if you have someone to blame all the bad stuff on, you can have the masses foaming at the mouth and champing at the bit on your side and you can do whatever you want to them and just blame it you know um as long as i mean even the even the concept of the scapegoat you know you know the original sort of the jewish thing of the goat that would bear the sins outside the city walls and they would stone it to death like it's incredible how um that seems to me to be a kind of almost like an eternal human reality yes you know for for somebody to almost be nominated as a sacrificial victim to take to bear the sins to bear the brunt of the sins of the tribe but yes. of course when that when that happens in a mass media climate we're talking about whole nations you know or whole whole peoples whole ethnicities um whole religions and when you when you find your bad guy you know again it's like this kind of propensity we have to want in mythic terms, we want to see the world as an eternal struggle between dark and light, and you know, it it is the whole idea that there is an axis of evil or yes. um, evil empire or yes. whatever it is. It's just turning everything into a four color comic book. You know, in fact, actually, four color comic books were more sophisticated than that. Often, you know, the nineteen sixties ones mm. were a lot were a lot more nuanced. Mm. Whereas, of course, Superman, one of the one of the reasons for his invention was to punch, punch Hitler in the face. Mm. You know, um, yes, but it's it's it, it, like the, the idea that um, we are being fed this sort of narrative of the eternal struggle. And I mean, I guess that any any religion is the same thing, isn't it? Okay, you know? Well, I was just going to say, look at the look, you look at Jesus Christ as the scapegoat. Yes, but that's not but that's not how we understand him now. No. But actually, but actually, but that's would exactly be what he was. 
That's exactly what he was. Exactly. But yeah. you see, again, here's another interesting example of what I was saying about just deflecting the story slightly. Mm. He is um, effectively, you know, you're saying it's a Jewish thing of the scapegoat. Mm. He obviously was a Jew, right? Mm. He scapegoated not by the Romans, but by the Jews, which is a right. great story if you've got your empire built in Rome. <laughs> and it's that yeah. type of thing that exactly. I mean. It's exactly. telling the story in exactly. such a way that it's not me, governor, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not me, governor. Um, you know, it's yeah. the, Look. Look at those baddies over there. A man came through the window and stole our stuff, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, this is this is what you realize is that it has forever been empire that's yes. using these tools. Yes. You know, and it goes back to the Roman Empire, but it goes back before that. Yes. It goes back to Persian Empire and the Egyptian Empire. And yeah. The, yeah. The Babylonian Empire. And all well, of I've, it's funny you say that. I, I was listening to something on YouTube about the Battle of Kadesh, which is possibly the first written account of a battle, and of course it's Ramesses II. Mm. And he's, you know, towers, you know, the king of kings and all this sort of business, you know, Ramesses, um, fighting the Hittites. And of course, he basically has his ass kicked. But it's not like that in the write-up. <laughs> you know, um, he was lucky to escape. Um and it was sort of it was a drawn battle basically, but yeah. but by the skin of his teeth he got out of it. But the interesting thing was that he lost all of the territory that they'd gained mm. in the the truce. Well, if so you've won a his, battle, you don't his, give it all away, do you? How did his spin doctors uh, manage to spin it? They did, they did. So you look at that and you think it's you know it's ever so. It's the story. Mm. Um, so that's yeah, that's good. So I, I like that. I think. And again, it, conspiracy, the, the sort of covering up of things is great fare for writing stuff, particularly subversive things, of course. Yeah, of course. And I think that also it's, um, you know, there's been a lot of kind of ink spilled on the topic. And I absolutely belong to the, the group who think the reason that people go for conspiracy theories is because, well, what, what people often say is that it's, it's more comforting to think that your life is shit because there is a secret cabal of yes. blood, blood drinking um, celebrities who yeah. are in charge, who are in the Illuminati, and they're what's messing everything up. And people say, yes, because that's more comforting than to think there's just no plan and it's just chaos and it's just but actually, I think even that is a kind of a, a blind. That is a it is a, a mask because actually, what the conspiracy theory is covering up is the actual conspiracy theory, which is just really simple: is that people love power and money, and people with power and money effectively are secret cabals running the world. Except they're not secret. Exactly. You know, and the thing is, that they, they just do it, do it out in plain sight, and then and then they say to everyone, "You can be like us too." If only you dream hard enough, exactly. you know. Of course, they of course can. if you've got if you've got the power and you've got the money, you can look at situations and be able to manipulate. Which is goes back to my story about um, Pearl Harbor and, and all the rest. Yeah, of it. you know, yeah, you only course. have to see what the situation is to get it to work in your favour. You know, you don't need to change the course of the of the river, do you? You just mm -hmm. have to work with the course of the river. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, it's, I think that what, what's really instructive as well is that, you know, in your Ramesses story, um, it's, it's an example of, yeah, history isn't written by the winners. It's written by the guy who pays the scribe, you know, like it's written by the, the people who own the media, whatever the media are, the people yes. who own the discourse in the public yes. sphere. And so he could spin his sort of running away with his tail between his legs as a miraculous escape from unwinnable odds or whatever it was. Um, and he's, and turned himself into um, a hero when he actually got his ass kicked. Um, because he's the guy who tells the scribes what to write or his, he and his government or whatever. Um, 
and it's it's the same now you know it's um i mean here's here's a great example and this is something that i was honest i only i only found out about this in the last couple of years and i was honestly shocked um which is about the french revolution do you, do you know the kind of background story of the french revolution well possibly depends where you're going to go with this well it's it's so there's i mean there's a lot to it it's a very complicated yes, thing but it basically is. it was nothing to do with um the poor rising up and no. revolting and in fact it was it was bankers it yes. was bankers it was the middle were, class yeah yeah and it, they were they were afraid that the aristocracy were going to default on their loans especially the king who had borrowed huge amounts of money to go to war and to buy gold-plated toilets or whatever it was yes um and they they were terribly afraid that the monarchy was just going to tell them to piss off and they were the new bourgeoisie you know they were gaining power and influence and they were also starting to associate in secret gentlemen's clubs um such as masons and girondins and um all of these things were you know and they started pulling strings um and there's this amazing story which is so illustrative which is yeah people were rioting because of the price of bread which was being artificially driven driven up but the people didn't for example decide to storm the bastille on yeah. their own and in fact there was only about seven or eight prisoners in the bastille yeah. anyway it was it wasn't to free anyone it no. was because it was because the particular guards that were guarding the bastille were loyal to the king and there was some kind of you know it was symbolic yeah. but, but you know how they got you know how they got them to storm us they went out into the streets and they, they rounded men up and they said here if you take this gun because the men didn't have guns like the, the, oh, no, you know they didn't have guns yeah. um so they said take this rifle a very kind of you know primitive rifles take this rifle and i'll give you a loaf, loaf of bread if you go and storm the bastille and they got a few hundred of them like that and then because they didn't want them running around armed they said now give us back the gun and we'll give you two loaves of bread and that you know that is it yeah it well, was, that is the, that is always the way of revolution isn't it because the yeah, russian yeah. revolution is always this thing about the workers and all the rest of it yeah it was the, and, it, it was it, it was the uh, academic well not academics particularly you know but the there were a lot intellectuals of intellectuals maybe, or, yeah very sort of astute political maneuvers mm. um and uh, you know it's quite possible that the most advanced political thinkers were in russia and just it, mm. just the fact that it ended up with bolsheviks mm. i mean some of the writings of anarchists and stuff like that were so so far ahead um, yeah anything else. absolutely and still and their insights still have not been no. ever really explored because no. what happened anarchism was demonized as a conspiracy plot it was it was a plot of um dangerous anarchists to yeah. blow people up yes because there were people who were identified as anarchists some of them not by themselves who ended up doing bombs and assassinations mm. but like you know that was not the fundamental belief of anarchism it wasn't yeah. about taking out political figures through violence yeah. but some people took it that way and they're the ones who got all the press of course um but it's it's insane to think that france for example has founded its sense of itself as a nation on the republic on liberty equality fraternity on that famous picture of liberty leading the people um on the marianne figure and all this the bare-breasted woman with the phrygian cap um like it's all a lie it's all a lie and the worst thing is that you also can't really denounce it because who could denounce liberty equality fraternity you know that's good right we all believe in that you know but again now the idea of being republican and the idea of um uh secularism what they call laicite in france is used as a as a stick to beat the um immigrant populations with muslims for example yeah you know they oppress them by uh, by 
making laws about them not being able to wear their traditional dress in public spaces, which, which only, you know, I mean, they only affect a small number of people anyway, but the laws are clearly discriminatory. And you know when they make them? They put these projects of these law proposals forward, these bills, always at a time when they're trying to put through a reform that screws people over like retirement or yeah. workers' rights. Yeah. And every time they've got one of them, they send up one of these incendiary polemic yeah. Yeah. things about the Muslim head. Scrap, yeah, so it you know? gets buried, basically. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And because the, because the Muslim population in France is a scapegoat. It's our current scapegoat, um, as it is in other places too. But, um, and you know, but the thing is, you say, um, as soon as you start saying, but come on, that is not what Muslims, like as a rule, are, are like. They're not Islamist terrorists. But the fact that there have been Islamist terrorist attacks, which were so publicized, that they started radicalizing other young, disaffected psychopaths who happened to be Muslim, even some who weren't and converted so that they could have some mayhem. You know, so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. And then you've got your perfect enemy, right? Yes. Um, different color skin, different God. They do things different there. Um, you know, it's just, it's really disgusting. Yes. Um, but I think that... Um, despite the fact that these stories of demonization and fear sell so many uh, newspapers or draw so many clicks uh, on the websites and 24-hour news cycles feed on them, I honestly think that there's a sort of a, a large minority of people um, who, who are waking up to the fact that this stuff is just not true. Like, it's, I think true, so. it's true enough. It's true enough to make it like to have evidence for it, but it's but it's cherry picking. It's always picking certain examples and casting them in a certain light, and you know, and also, I mean, sometimes, as you say, sheer manipulation. Um, did they really ignore the warning of such and such an attack? Did they really? Um, I mean, you know the story about um, about Trump just being a dick and dismantling Obama's um, pandemic response um, body, you know? But you say to yourself, oh, how convenient, <laughs> you know? But then it's, it's one of those things where you go, oh, well, he must have planned it. But then you're like, yeah, but also, I mean, they were just idiots. Mm. Also, like they were, they were not only um, scheming and evil, but they were also idiots. So it might have just been human error, you know, um, that they dismantled something that was necessary just to spit in the eye of the previous administration. Like, you know, I, I would never, I would never disregard the motivations of just cupidity and spite. Exactly, because it's a very important historical element. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been it's, a lot um, of. Uh, a lot of people that you think, well, how did they get to where they got to and be so stupid? Um, but then Hitler's Third Reich is a good example of that. But there we go. Yeah, because apparently he was a real idiot. Yeah. Um, but well, they're all like, completely off their face most of the time. Yeah, so. that's right. They were all on, they were on speed most of the time, weren't they? Well, the, the army were on speed. Yeah. Most of the generals were on heroin because that's what was being, um, you know, they were medicating just about everything. Yeah, with yeah, yeah. opiates. Yeah. So you, you know, um, it's. I mean, this strikes me as well. Is that um, we are living in the we are living in the age of the fool, of the clown, um, right? Of, of the wicked clown, because Trump is one, Boris Johnson is another. See, the thing is, they're not as stupid as they seem. I mean, they are stupid, but they act more stupid because it's relatable and because people like the trickster people like the one who is bold and willing to say anything you know who is not politically correct people love that stuff they love that guy because that guy he's a classic kind of commedia dell'arte character he's a yes. classic archetype you know he's yes. mr punch you know yes mr punch mr punch is a dick like he's really not nice 
but he puts one over the policeman and he he puts one over you know he um and 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 you know we've all heard the stories like of how um you know bojo and trump like the way that they presented themselves even physically even in their clothes there was a level of reflection to it that was a bit more um, artificial than we thought or trump's tweets you know i mean like yes he was monumentally psychotically narcissistic but i'm willing to bet that the kind of the um the, the misspellings and the all caps and all that kind of stuff like that was partly on purpose you know a kind of a take no prisoners shooting from the hip kind of stuff and it's on the same continuum as obama addressing you know a crowd as folks you know mm-hmm. it's folksy it's trying to appear like one of us whereas obama and trump and hillary and they're all still part of the establishment. They're all the same establishment. Now, I'm not going to say they're equivalent, because they're certainly not. But, mm. you know, I mean, Trump, um, what, what, was, what was the thing? Um, the Clintons were at Trump's wedding? Yeah, probably, you know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, they all know one another. Yeah, because, because they were celebrities, and he was a celebrity. Mm. Celebrities hang out together. They don't care about politics. Mm. I think Trump cares about abortion. No. I think he cares about religion god no like all of those things i mean I, I honestly think that at a certain level of power people are more or less politically like agnostic completely like they don't care about any of those issues any of those hot button issues they just don't care it's beneath them you know little people worry about that stuff yeah interesting stuff so going back to you your work that you've got coming out you you've got this thing i'm i'm interested in all your um your little Facebook ventures, which we sort of skated over. Oh, yeah. So tell me a little bit about how that sort of interest in, in this sort of magical thinking. Uh, or, yeah, let's leave it as that for the moment. Yeah. Um, so tell me how that sort of developed and, and what, your, what your plans are, if you can have plans with those sort of things. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, there, there was definitely a plan. There was definitely a plan because, um, so um, what I'm going to describe, I realized um, kind of halfway through me doing it was I was creating a hyper mm. right? So you, you know what these are, right? Which yeah, is I like, took, you might need to explain. I'm go- but I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. but, um, but you'll, be able to, you'll be able to kind of back me up and elaborate. Um, but basically, so if a sigil is inscribing a kind of a glyph, a sign that represents a desire, and then charging it through ecstatic or some other kind of gnosis, like charging it with energy from yourself, and then kind of fire and forget, like get rid of it or burn it, or just leave it somewhere where you'll catch sight of it occasionally and forget. Mm-hmm. And then it's supposed to manifest that desire, right? So that's a sigil. It's, it's almost like um, it's very big in chaos magic and it's really um, the idea that writing has power and that like, if you design a symbol that includes somehow your desire, you sigilize your, your, your thing, um, that that somehow focuses not only your energy, but a sort of a, um, I guess it, it, it's, it's almost like, it's a bit like um, the secret only cool. Right, yes. it's like you know, manifest your manifest your desire, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but it's like except that it looks squiggly and awesome, you know. Um, and so it was, you know, um, Austin Osman Spare in the nineteen twenties who kind of first theorized it, but I think people have been doing it forever. Oh, correct. Well, look you, at all those I, seals that you used to see written on. Yeah, medieval exactly, and and even any and stuff any like um, any writing that is an ideogram exactly is, so, is yeah. already a complex idea. Expressed Back to our in Egyptians one, again. Yeah. Exactly. Expressed in one sign. And um, so yeah, I mean, this is this has a long history, like a secret sign, a seal, a glyph, a rune, um, all of that stuff. Um, so a hyper sigil is when you create a large and extended um artistic or um 
it could be artistic, it could be literary, you could also do it with technology, you could do it with basically when you take several areas of your life and you create a kind of a ramifying work of art that is supposed to um, activate and kind of permeate how you're living and change reality. And what I realized when I was halfway through it is that that's what I was doing because my situation was, um, so three years ago, um, I was having a bit of a crisis of, of confidence and a bit of a crisis of faith because I'd always fancied myself as a writer. Um, and then after that didn't seem to be taking off, I sort of fell back on being an academic. And then that didn't seem to be taking off because, you know, I did the whole thing. I did the PhD and everything, but there was just no jobs. There was just nothing going, you know? And in the end, um, I ended up getting a job in a school and, uh, you know, and I loved it. I loved teaching. Um, uh, there were bad sides that were for other reasons, but the teaching part was brilliant. And, um, you know, I loved that kind of contact with sort of young people. And they were particularly like bright and interesting group of kids. Um, so yeah, it was great. And I thought, well, okay, maybe this is it. Maybe I'm a teacher and maybe uh, this is what I was supposed to do. And, and maybe that's okay, you know, and I'm just going to be okay with that. And um, but two things happened um, that year. Um, the first one was um, that uh, two people entirely separately um, asked me to officiate their weddings. Um, right. And yeah, yeah. And both of them, um, one is my sister and one is one of my best friends in Paris. And both of them wanted weddings that were kind of spiritual, but not religious, but not really spiritual. You know, that yeah, kind of thing. Um, so they wanted it to be kind of cool and poetic and meaningful, but not religious in any way. Um, and so, and I was like, yeah, hell yeah, I'll do it. And I was joking with both of them, kind of teasing them that I was going to dress up as a druid to do it. And, um, you know, I'd had, I'd had an ongoing you know, long-standing interest in in magic and the occult and mysterious and all that. And I'd studied that stuff and I'd practiced that stuff, but always in private, in secret, on my own. And never really been able to talk about it to anyone because I just didn't have the people. Um, and around this time, and I did this thing, I was like, oh, wow, I just officiated a wedding ceremony and did another one. And it was really cool. And I thought, wow, you know, Maybe there's something to the idea of being having a sort of a of ministering in a sort of a spiritual way more publicly. Like, you know, you can be a magician in your in your bedroom on your spare time. But I was like, no, well, maybe, maybe there's something to it. Because what did I do there was I just I just solemnized a, 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 a milestone in life, a, a ceremony that was um huge for these people and both both of them were quite different but they both worked really well um and i thought this is maybe there is a role to in public bring a more sort of um enchanted view of the world forward however my problem was that i was um that I was still a school teacher and you can't go sort of claiming to be a wizard and also, you know, be, be a school teacher. But then, but the other thing that happened was that um, for my 40th birthday, um, my wife, Laura, uh, had the idea of asking everyone to club together and sending me on a writer's retreat. And at this point, I had very, very um, big doubts about my capacity to ever be a writer and whether it's ever a thing that's going to happen because I've been frustrated for so many years. I wasn't even getting time to write, didn't have the energy, two young kids, big full-time job, <clears throat> very stressful. And, you know, it was just like, you're never going to do it. But um, she had the idea to send me on this uh, writer's retreat and, um, and it was just amazing. And, you know, which also involved her saying, I will take care of the kids for a week, you know? Um, now, she, so what she did was she, we went to my parents in Ireland and she stayed with them with the kids so that she had a bit of a helping hand. And I went down to West Cork 
to this most amazing place um, in on the Bera Peninsula in Iris, and the name of the the name of the uh, treat is Anamkara, which means soul friend in Irish. But what Lord didn't know, she picked it because it was close to Cork. But what she didn't know was that Anamkara is also the title of a book, a beautiful book by John O'Donoghue, who was an ex-priest and poet um, who died young. And he wrote this in the 90s on Celtic spirituality. And Anamkara was the name of his book. And in both of the weddings, I had used the blessing that is in the first page of that book as the final blessing of the wedding. And, and she didn't know that. No. But, she, but it was random. Yes. And, I, and I just had this, I mean, obviously, it wasn't random. It was a coincidence. Yes. It was two things that happened that were the same. Yes. Synchronous, almost, one might say. And then I ended up um, at Anankara on, in a rainy week in March. Um, and had the most amazing experience and suddenly became alive to the way in which I could claim, uh, make a claim on, on poetry and on my, and on my, um, my native soil and my native landscape and its mythology. And the woman who runs it, um, uh, Sue Forbes Booth, is absolutely amazing. She's so great and she has nurtured and um, being a patron and being a, a sounding board to so many Irish poets. Um, and it, it turned out that the week I was there, I was the only person. So I was, the, you know, they can, they can accommodate up to 12 people at any one time. And it was just me. Um, and I was totally alone. And the night before I left, my daughter poured water on my phone. Um, you know, she was, she was one. So I, I don't know if she was, really thinking about it, but it meant that I had no phone, um, very, very patchy internet. And I just spent, you know, I sat, I had, I brought a novel with me to finish and I sat down for the first day and I wrote that and it was really cool. And then uh, the next day I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm walking down to the beach and I'm going to do poetry. And I started, you know, I was standing, declaiming poetry to the waves and the wind. And that just, something happened, you know? Yeah. And uh, when I came back, I felt like I had won my artistic license, so mm. to speak. But the problem was what to do, because I still can't, you know, uh, publish anything because no one wants it. And I have no money to like fund my own publication. Um, and so I just started a blog. But at the time, because I didn't want, you know, if, you, if you're kind of a public sort of person, like a teacher, people can Google you, like, the kids, the parents, the colleagues, anyone. And if there's stuff that comes up under your name, it will be known. And so I wanted, I didn't want to be, you know, thinking all the time about this kind of audience looking over my shoulder. So I started publishing a blog um, anonymously, but under a pseudonym. And then it kind of ramified because um, the pseudonym I chose, which is Malika Severnus, which is what you first met me under, was sort of my, what I had taken you know in my own sort of on my own sort of way as as my magical name um and it it, it, it is so for many reasons but then on the blog i was like oh you know it'd be cool what if i pretend that this blog has multiple contributors but i just write all of them yes you know and so i started using the names of contributors and they were characters from my previous novels Yes. And they were characters that I invented. Um, Wonderful. And so, and then I invented a kind of a whole backstory for them. And Malika Severnus was the kind of the, the head honcho, but they were like a group of students who had all ended up in Paris during the 2000s and had all been pulled into this kind of, um, yeah. So it turned into, you know, my own little conspiracy theory. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I, I created a conspiracy and then... Because I found suddenly that I was really bored with social media because I really hated seeing pictures of people's cats and their lunches <laughs> and their kids. I mean, kids are, kids are cute, but who cares? Like, honestly, yeah. who cares? You know? And I thought, oh, well, you know what? What if I were to use social media to meet people I don't know? Not people I already know. Like, I don't really, you know, whatever. It's nice to keep tabs on, you know, someone you went to primary school with, but really? Who cares? Yeah. Um, and so I said, what if 
And I started using it in like the opposite way. I started joining groups, interest groups. Right. And, I would, and I would just Google something like, you know, witchcraft or yeah. I would yeah. Google druidry yeah. or, you know, whatever. And I would just join groups and start connecting with people. And then I realized, ooh, hang on a sec. My Facebook profile is also pretty traceable. You know, as I found out later, it, it, it really was like you couldn't just like, be so careful about social media in terms of employment. But um, and so I was like, well, you know what I'll do? I'll make a fake profile under the Malachis Avernus name. And I did. And it was hilarious because it was a runaway successful experiment in a sense, because um, he was obviously much more um, gung ho and swashbuckling than the real me. And he would do all sorts of crazy things um, online. And, you know, and also, like, I think the profile only existed for three months, but um, it racked up 5,000 friends um, in, in three months. And wow. at one point, there was people, I was getting friend requests, like, you know, you know, a dozen an hour. Wow. Um, That's because, amazing. Yeah, because the algorithm. Yeah. I, I just, that, the profile went viral slightly, yeah. slightly, in a small way. Yeah, no, no, um, no it's and, and so what I was using the profile for was not um, to tech talk about my life. It was to mythologize my life mm. because I didn't want to talk about my real life. What I wanted to do was I wanted to write it into a kind of a hyper sigil. Yes, um, that's really. A, a, a kind of a hypertext yeah. novel, which was interactive. Yeah. As in, I was telling a story about what my life was, had become. Um, and I was telling it in a kind of a poetic and sideways sort of way. But other people could interact with the story. It was like a sort of a, a and you know, I, I often think that all these, these sort of occult people online with nom de guerre, nom de plume, um, it's all a bit of a big lark, isn't it? You know, um, like a lot of them, you know, frat or this and sore or that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, yeah, yeah. and uh, people, pe you know, people with names that are like, you know, um, Lucifer, Morrigan, Zeus, um, Omani, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, and, and in, in fairness, like, I'm not throwing shade on anyone who, who uses um, the names of their favorite patron deities or whatever. That's totally fine. Um, because, you know, why not? And it also says something. You know, it says, I am available to be friends with you if you are a Luciferian, um, yes. vegetarian, or whatever. Um, and, you know, the profile picture plus the name, often neither of which correspond to the real person, um, they send out a signal. That's the character they're playing. Yes. Um, but also, I think it's, you know, it's, it's corresponding to a deep need for a lot of people, which is to express their interest in esoteric subjects uh, with like-minded people because they can't in real life, you know, in sure. real life, in real life, they're Bob from accounts or. Well, that's you know, an interesting point here because like I was, I was talking to, uh, I did an interview with uh, Dr. Jack Hunter. Who's, oh yes. Yes. I, I mean, yeah. 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 Um, and of course he did his uh, PhD or on, I can't remember which one it was undergrad or whatever, but in, um, in a spiritualist circle. In, that's right and, and i actually i've heard that episode it's brilliant yes um it's really really fascinating yeah well the thing is that you know i've had some sort of connection with spiritualism and circles and stuff like that and what always fascinated me is that you get the people that were really like li literally blew your socks off because you thought mm. I, I don't understand how you did that because that is pretty they were just ordinary I mean, totally yeah. ordinary. Yeah, um, yeah. And you would never have thought them as being anything, you know. And of course, it, you know, if you go down to somewhere like Glastonbury in the UK, there are more there are more wizard hats and cloaks than you can mm -hmm. shake a stick at, you know, or a wand at. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But it's th there's this other layer, like a quiet layer, of people who are, let's say, mystical. Mm you know, magical people who are unseen. They're not yeah. the ones that you you would see. Um, and exactly. in a way, 
what you're talking about, your experience about creating uh, you know, a, a name to, to reach out artistically and and as a, you know, as a you know, use the word hypersexual. I mean, celebrity is exactly that. I mean, yeah, these celebrity yeah. characters are not what you think they are. They're something yeah. completely different. Yeah. They're, playing They're playing they characters. They are playing yeah. characters. And my own experience about that awkward thing of producing a piece of work is you always know the bit that you don't like. Mm. That's always the bit that you excuse when you say, this is something I've done and unfortunately, blah, blah, blah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And we all do it as artists. But you don't do it if it's not got your name on it. Well, exactly. You don't have to apologize for it. You anything, don't. Right. And, suddenly, and also, and also for me, it was so liberating yeah. to, to write in different names and different personae because when you're being yourself as an artist, you're always like, ooh, what would I say? And what would that make people think of me? Exactly. But if you're if you're saying to yourself, you know, um, what would Mick Toomey say about this, the old bastard, you know. And then immediately it writes itself because you're writing in character exactly. because what you're doing and you could say that what you're doing is you are channeling your own little servitor spirit there or exactly. your, tulpa, your tulpa that you've created. Exactly. Like maybe, maybe I have a little stable of tulpas and what they are is spirits that come to help me with my writer's block. But exactly. this is, you know, Yates said exactly the same thing or depending on who you believe, you know, his wife, Georgie Hydelees, was um, an amazing channeler of spirits. Or she was an incredibly well-educated and very creative woman who knew exactly how to keep him interested. Yes. Or maybe a bit of both. Yes. And at one point, apparently, he asked the spirits, you know, that were visiting him um, through her. He said, what is your purpose? And the spirits responded, we come to give you metaphors for your poetry. You know, and if that's the spirits, then they were spot on. And if that was Georgie, damn, you know, exactly. she's like, if because the thing is, Georgie was handpicked by a bunch of occultist friends of Yates who were sick of him proposing to Maud Gong over and over and then, <laughs> propos and then proposing to her 17 year old daughter the same day at one point, Isolt. And they were like, can you just stop? Um, and they were like, we need to get this guy married, you know. And so they picked Georgie, handpicked, but she was extremely educated in the occult and in literature and in all of this stuff. And like, if anyone could have pulled off faking mediumship in a, in a way that would appeal to him, then that's exactly, that's exactly what, uh, oh, we have a visitor. Ah, oh. oh, hello. It's, it's Esme. Hello, Esme. My hair is nearly as long as yours, but not quite. Look. Yeah. How long is it? Oh, yes. Can you hear? Yes. Can you hear him? That's me? Yeah. That's Vic. He said, okay, listen, Esme, will you let, just let me finish this? I'll be finished yeah. in a minute. And okay. I'll, I'll come down to you in a minute, okay? Yeah, Mwah. only a few minutes. There we go. Hello. Oh. Ooh. Okay. I guess no, I'm, going just, to do the, I'm going to do the rest of this with Esme on my knee. Okay? Yeah, no, that's good. You've, that's good. you've, you've seen me with this configuration I before. Have. I have. Yeah. She's... Um, yes. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's really fascinating. And again, we probably will have to go even deeper into this, but we're going to, so. we're going to have what? to do this. Um, um, I, think we, I think we. this may be our cue to wrap it up. What do you think? I think so. Because and we've actually know, got I don't two know what episodes it's like. out of this. I know. And I don't know what it's like in your house, but um, Friday night in my house is movie and pizza night. And, uh, is it? We, we, we oh, want I'll to have that. to come around to your house. We want to get that going on. You should. Um, <laughs> it's, it is not to be missed. And so right. these kids have just come home from school uh, and they're really tired and all they want is um, movie and pizza. That sounds good. So, or, on that note or actually, actually, we might have pasta tonight. What do you think? Yeah? No pizza. No pizza? Oh. Okay. There we go. Right. That's it. Oh, it's not movie night tonight. What is it tonight? It's, it's, we don't have a movie. We got a movie night. 
movie night. That's right. We don't call it movie. We call it movie night. Right. Okay. That's good. Well, anyway, thanks a million. Um, that's great. Well, that's great, Mark. Thanks ever so much again for your time. Oh, yeah. Totally, totally welcome. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Oh, yeah, totally. For me as well. Absolutely. All right. I'm sure we'll speak again very soon. You can say bye, yeah. You can say bye, yeah. Esme says bye. Yeah. See you then, Esme. A happy New Year to you both. Thank you very much. See you soon. See you again. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Remember to check out the show notes um, for Mark's work. And uh, we'll be speaking to Mark again soon because uh, we still haven't got down to the, as he p- puts it, the well of weird Um which will be very, very interesting. Okay, so until next time, see you then.